Chapter 2 In Memoriam Harry was bleeding. Clutching his right hand in his left and swearing under his breath, he shouldered open his bedroom door. There was a crunch of breaking china. He had trodden a cup of cold tea that had been sitting on the floor outside his bedroom door. What the? He looked around. The landing on number four Privet Drive was deserted. Possibly the cup of tea was Dudley's idea of a clever booby trap. Keeping his bleeding hand elevated, Harry scraped the fragments of cup together with the other hand and threw them into the already crammed bin, just visible inside his bedroom door. Then he tramped across to the bathroom to run his finger under the tap. It was stupid, pointless, irritating beyond belief that he still had four days left of being unable to perform magic. But he had to admit to himself that this jagged cut in his finger would have defeated him. He had never learned how to repair wounds, and now he came to think of it, particularly in light of his immediate plans, this seemed a serious flaw in his magical education. Making a mental note to ask Hermione how it was done, he used a large wad of toilet paper to mop up as much of the tea as he could before running, returning to his bedroom and slamming the door behind him. Harry had spent the morning completely emptying his school trunk for the first time since he had packed it six years ago. At the start of the intervening school years, he had merely skimmed up the topmost three quarters of the contents and replaced or updated them, leaving a layer of general debris at the bottom. Old quills, desiccated beetle eyes, single socks that no longer fit. Minutes previously, Harry had plunged his hand into his mulch experienced a stabbing pain in the fourth finger of his right hand and withdrawn it to see a lot of blood. He now proceeded a little more cautiously. Kneeling down beside a trunk again, he groped around the bottom and, after retrieving an old badge that flickered feebly between support Cedric Diggory and Potter sticks, a cracked and worn-out sneakoscope and a gold locket inside which a note signed R.A.B., had been hidden. He finally discovered the sharp edge that had done the damage. He recognized it at once. It was a two-inch-long fragment of the enchanted mirror that his dead godfather, Sirius, had given him. Harry laid it aside and felt cautiously around the trunk for the rest, but nothing more remained of his godfather's last gift, except powdered glass, which clung to the deepest layer of debris like glittering grit. Harry sat up and examined the jagged piece in which he had cut himself, seeing nothing but his own bright green eye reflected back at him. Then he placed the fragment on top of that morning's daily prophet, which lay and breathed in the bed, and attempted to stem the sudden upsurge of bitter memories, the stabs of regret and of longing, the discovery of the broken mirror, and assassinated by attacking the rest of the rubbish in the trunk. It took another hour to empty it completely, throw away the useless items, and sort the remainder in piles according to whether or not he would need them from now on. His school and quidditch robes, cauldron, parchment, quills, and most of his textbooks were piled in a corner to be left behind. He wondered about what, what his aunt and uncle would do with them. Burn them in the dead of night, probably, if there were evidence of some dreadful crime. His muggle clothing, invisibility cloak, potion-making kit, certain books, the photograph album Hagrid had once given him, a stack of letters, and his wand had been repacked into an old rust stack. In the front pocket were the marauder's map and the locket with the note signed R.A.B. inside it. The locket was called this place of honour, not because it was valuable, in all u usual senses in it was worthless, but because of what it had to cost it to attain it. This left a sizable stack of newspapers sitting on his desk beside his streaming owl Hedwig, one for which of the days Harry had spent at the private drive this summer. He got off of the floor, stretched, and moved across his de desk. Hedwig made no movement as he began to flick through the newspapers, throwing them into the rubbish pile one by one. The owl was asleep, or else faking. She was angry with Harry about the limited amount of time she was allowed out of her cage at the moment. As he neared the bottom of the pile of newspapers, Harry slowed down, 
searching for one particular issue that he knew had arrived shortly after he had returned to the Privet Drive for summer. He remembered that there had been a small mention in the front about the re resignation of Charity Burbage, the Muggle Studies teacher at Hogwarts. At last, he found it. Turning to page 10, he sank into his desk chair and reread the article he had been looking for. Albus Dumbledore Remembered by Althea Stoach I met Albus Dumbledore at the age of 11 and our first day at Hogwarts. Our mutual attraction was undoubtedly due to the fact that we both felt ourselves to be outsiders. I had contracted dragon pox shortly before arriving at school, and while I was no longer contagious, my pock-mocked visage and greenish hue did not encourage many to approach me. For his part, Albus had arrived at Hogwarts under the burden of unwanted notoriety. Scarcely had your ear previously, his father, Percival, had been convicted of a savage and well-publicized attack upon three young muggles. Albus never attempted to deny that his father, who was to die in Azkaban, had committed this crime. On the contrary, when I plucked up courage to ask him, he assured me that he knew his father to be guilty. Beyond that, Dumbledore refused to speak to the sad business, though many attempted to make him do so. Some, indeed, were deposed to praise his father's action and assume that Albus too was a huggle muggle hater. They could not have been more mistaken. As anybody who knew Albus would attest, is never revealed the remost, remotest anti-muggle tendency. Indeed, his determined sport support for muggle right gained him many enemies and subsequent ease. In a matter of months, however, Albus's own fame had begun to eclipse that of his father. By the end of his first year, he would never again to be known as the son of a muggle hater, but as nothing more or less than the most brilliant student ever seen at the school. Those of us who are privileged to be his friends benefited from this example, not to mention his help and encouragement. With each, he was always generous. He confessed to me later in his life that he knew even then that his greatest pleasure lay in teaching. He not only won every prize of note that the school offered, he was soon in the regular correspondence with the most notable magical names of the day, including Nicholas Flamel, the celebrated alchemist, Bethula Bagshot, the noted historian, and Albert Woffling, the magical theatrician. Several of his papers found their way into learned publications such as Transfiguration Today, Challenges and Charming, and The Practical Potioneer. Dumbledore's future career seemed likely to be metric, and the only question that remained was when he would have become Minister for Magic. Though it was often predicted in later years that he was on the point of taking the job, however, he never had ministerial ambitions. Three years after we had started at Hogwarts, Albus's brother Aberforth arrived at school. They were not alike. Aberforth was never bookish and, unlike Albus, preferred to settle arguments by dueling rather than through reasoned discussion. However, it is quite wrong to suggest, as some have, that the brothers were not friends. They rubbed along uncomfortably, as two such different boys could do. My fairness to Aberforth is it must be admitted that living in Albus's shadow cannot be an altogether comfortable experience. Being continually outshone in a, a, a occupational hazard of being his friend and cannot have been my any more pleasurable as a brother. When Albus and I left Hogwarts, we intended to take a then traditional tour of the world together visiting and observing foreign wizards before pursuing our separate careers. However, tragedy intervened on the very eve of our trip. Albus's mother, Kendra, died, leaving Albus the head and sole breadwinner of the family. I postponed my departure long enough to pay my respects in Kendra's funeral, then left for what was now to be a desultory journey. With a younger brother and sister to care for, Andrew took a list to them, there could no longer be any question of Albus accompanying me. That was the period of our lives when we had least contact, 
I wrote to Albus describing, perhaps intensively, the wonders of my journey, from our escape from Chimeras and Greece to the experience of the Egyptian alchemists. His letters told me little of his day-to-day -day life, which I guess to be frustratingly dull for such a brilliant wizard. Immersed in my own experiences, it was with horror that I heard, toward the end of my year's travels, another tragedy had struck the Dumbledores, the death of a sister, Ariana. Though Ariana had been in a poor health for a long time, the blow, coming so soon after the loss of her mother, had a profound effect in both of our brothers. All those closest to Albus, and I count myself one what that lucky number, agreed that Ariana's death and Albus's feeling of personal responsibility for it, though of course he was guiltless, left their mark upon him forevermore. I returned home to find a young man who had experienced a much older person's suffering. Albus was more reserved than before, and much less light-hearted. To add to his misery, the loss of Ariana and had led not to a renewed closeness between Albus and Aberforth, but to an entrenchment. In time, this would lift, in later years they re-established, re if not a close relationship, then certainly a cordial one. However, he rarely spoke of his parents or of Ariana from them on, and his parents, friends learned not to mention them. Other quills will describe the triumph of the following years. Dumbledore's in innumerable contribution of the store of wizarding knowledge, including his discovery of the twelve uses of dragon's blood, will benefit generations to come, as will the wisdom he displays in many judgment while chief warlock of the Wizengamot. They say, still, that no wizarding duel ever matched up between Dumbledore and Grindelwald in 1945. Those who witnessed it have been written of the terror and the awe they felt as they watched those two extraordinary wizards to battle. Dumbledore's triumph and its consequences for the wizarding world are considered a turning point in magical history to match the introduction of the International Statute of Secrecy or the downfall of he who must not be named. Alice Dumbledore was never proud to vain. He could find something to value in anyone, however apparently insignificant or wretched it. And I believe that his early losses endured him with great humanity and sympathy. I shall miss his friendship more than I can say, for my loss is nothing compared to the wizarding world. That he was the most inspiring and the best loved of all Hogwarts headmasters never cannot be in question. He died as he lived, working always for the greater good, and, to his last hour, as willing to stretch out a hand to a small boy with dragonpox as he was on the day I met him. Harry finished reading, but continued to gaze at the picture accompanying the obliterate. Dumbledore was wearing his familiar, kindly smile, but he, as he peered over the top of his half-moon spectacles, he gave the impression, even in newsprint, of X-raying Harry, whose sadness mingled with dense humiliation. He had thought he knew Dumbledore quite well, but ever since re reading this obituary, he had been forced to recognise that he had barely known him at all. Though once he had imagined Dumbledore's childhood or youth, it was as though he had sprung into being as Harry had known him, about vulnerable and silver-haired and old. The idea of a teenage Dumbledore was simply odd, like trying to imagine a stupid Hermione or a friendly blast and it screwed. He had never thought to ask Dumbledore about his past, no doubt, it would have been felt strange, impertinent even, but after all, it had been in common knowledge that Dumbledore had taken part in that legendary duel with Grindelwald, and Harry had not thought to ask Dumbledore what that had been like, nor about any of his other famous achievements. No, they had always discussed Harry, Harry's past, Harry's future, Harry's plans, and it seemed to Harry now, despite the fact that his future was so dangerous and so uncertain, that he had missed irrespaceful opportunities when he had failed to ask Dumbledore more about himself, even though the only personal question he had ever asked his headmaster was also the only one he had suspected that Dumbledore had not answered honestly. What do you see when you look in the mirror? I? I see myself holding a pair of thick, woolen socks. After several minutes thought, 
Harry tore the obituary out of the prophet, folded it carefully, and tucked it inside the first volume of Practical Defensive Magic and its use against the dark arts. Then he drew the rest of the newspaper under the rubbish pile and turned to face the room. It was much tighter. The only things left out of what were placed were today's daily prophet, still lying in the bed, and on top of it, the piece of broken mirror. Harry moved across the room, slid the mirror fragment of today's prophet, and unfolded the newspaper. He had merely glanced at the headline when he had taken the rolled-up paper from the delivery owl early that morning and thrown it aside, after noting that it had it said nothing about Voldemort. Harry was sure that the Ministry was leaning on the prophet to suppress news about Voldemort. It was only now, therefore, that he saw that he had missed. Across the bottom half of the front page, a small headline was set over the picture of Dumbledore striding along, looking harried. Dumbledore, the truth at last. Coming next week, the shocking story of a fluid gen genius considered by many to be the greatest wizard of his generation, striving away the popular image of serene, silver-bearded wisdom, Rita Skeeter reveals his disturbed childhood, the lawless youth, the lifelong fuse, and the guiltiest secrets that Dumbledore carried to his grave. Why was the man tipped to be the Minister of Magic content to remain the he mere headmaster? What was the real purpose of the secret organization known as the Order of the Phoenix? How did Dumbledore really meet his end? The answers to these and many more questions are explored in the explosive new biography, The Life and Lies of Albus Dumbledore by Rita Skeeter, exclusively interviewed by Barry Braithwaite. Page 13 inside. Harry ripped open the paper and found page 13. The article was topped with a picture showing another familiar face. A woman wearing jeweled glasses with elaborately curled blonde hair, her teeth bared in what was clearly supposed to be a winning smile, wiggling her fingers up at him. Doing his best to ignore this nauseating image, Harry read on. In person, Rita Skeeter is much warmer and softer than her famously furious... Ferocious quill portraits, my suggest. Greeting me in the hallway of a cosy home, she lets me straight into the kitchen to for a cup of tea, a slice of pound cake, and, it goes without saying, a steaming fat of fresh hest gossip. Well, of course, Dumbledore was a big biographer's dream, says Skeeter. Such a long fall knife. I'm sure my book will be the first of very, very many. Skeeter was suddenly quicked up the mark. Her 900-page book was completed in a mere four weeks after Dumbledore's mysterious death in June. I asked her how she managed a super-past feat. Oh, uh, when you've been a journalist as long as I have, working to deadline a second nature. I know where the wizarding world was clamouring for the full story and I wanted to be the first to meet the need. I mentioned the recent, recent, widely publicised remarks of Elphia Stoad, special advisor to the Wizengamot and long-standing friend of Albus Dumbledore's, that Skeeter's book contained less fact than a chocolate raw card. Skeeter threw his back on her head and laughed. Darling, dodgy! I remember interviewing him a few years back about mere people rise, bless him. Suddenly, Gaga seems to think we're sitting at the bottom of the lake window, mare. kept telling me to watch out for Trent. And yet, of his daughter's accusation of inaccuracy had been echoed in many places. The Seater really feel that four short weeks had been enough to gain a full picture of Dumbledore's long and extraordinary life. Oh, my dear, beamed Skeeter, wrapping me affectionately across the knuckles. You know as well as I do of how much information can be generated by the fat back of galleons, a refusal to hear the word no, and a nice sharp, quick coat quick. People were cooning to dish to dart dirt in Dumbledore's anyway. Not everyone thought he was so wonderful, you know. He trod in on an awful lot of important too. But old dodgy Doge can get off his high hippogriff, because I had been assessed to source most journalists was swapped the ones for. One who has never spoken in public before, and who was close to Dumbledore during the most turbulent and disturbing phase of his youth. That the advanced publicity for Skeeter's biography was certainly suggests that there will be shocks in store for those who believe Dumbledore to have led a blameless life. What were the biggest surprise she uncovered, I asked. Now come on, 
bothered, Betty. I'm not giving any way of the highlights before anybody bought the book, laughed Skeeter. But I can promise that everybody, anybody who still thinks Dumbledore was white as a beard is in for rude equining. Let's just say that nobody hears him rate against you-know-who would have dreamed that he dabbed in the dark arts himself in his youth. And for a wizard who spent his later years pleading for tolerance, he wasn't exactly broad-minded when he was younger. Yes, I was Dumbledore had an extremely murky past, not to mention that very fishy family which he worked so hard to keep hushed up. I asked whether Skeeter was referring to Dumbledore's brother, Aberforth, who... Conviction by the Wizinger Moth for misuse of magic caused a minor scandal fifteen years ago. Oh, Aberforth is just a tip of the dung deep, laughed Skeeter. No, no, I'm talking about much worse than a brother with a fondness for fiddling about goats. Worse than the muggle a maiming father. Dumbledore couldn't keep either of them quite anyway. They were both charged by the Wizinger Moth. No, it's the mother and the sister that were intrude me. And the little digging uncurved a positive nest of nastiness. But, as I say, you'll have to wait for chapters 9 and 12 for full details. As I can say now is, it's no wonder Dumbledore never talk about how his nose got broken. Family skeletons, notwithstanding, does Sigita deny the brilliance that led to Dumbledore's many magical discoveries? He had brains, he conceded. Although many now questions whether he could really take full credit for all of his supposed achievements. As I reveal in chapter 16, Ivor Delonsi De De claims he had already discovered eight uses of dragon's blood when Dumbledore borrowed his papers. But the importance of some of the Dumbledore's achievements cannot, I venture, be denied. What of his famous defeat of Grindelwald? Oh, now, I'm glad you mentioned Grindelwald, said Skeeter with such a tantalizing smile. I'm afraid those who go dewy eyed have dumbled a spectacular victory. Must brace themselves for a bombshell or perhaps dong bomb. Very dirty business indeed. All I say is, don't be so sure, sure that there really was a spectacular duel of legend. After they read my book, people may be forced to conclude that Grindelwald simply conjured a white handkerchief from this end of his wand and came quietly. Skeeter refuses to give any more away in this intriguing subject, so we turn instead to the relationship that will undoubtedly fascinate our readers more than any other. Oh, yes, said Skeeter, nodding briskly. I devote an entire chapter to the whole Potter and Dumbledore relationship. It's been called unhealthy, if it's sinister. Again, your readers will have to buy my book for the poor story, but there is no cushion that Dumbledore took in a natural interest in Potter from the word go. Whether that was really the boy's interest, best interests, well, well, we'll see. It's certainly an open secret that Potter has some most troubled at idolances. I ask whether Skeeter is still in touch with Harry Potter, who so she so famously interviewed last year, a breakthrough piece in which Potter spoke exclusively of his conviction that you know who had returned. Oh yes, we've developed a closer bond, said Skeeter. Poor Potter has few real friends, and we met in one of the most testing moments of his life, the Triwizard Tournament. I'm probably one of the only people alive who can say that they knew the real Harry Potter. Which leads us neatly to the many rumours still circulating about Dumbledore's final hours. This Skeeter believed that Potter was there and Dumbledore died. Well, I don't want to say too much. It's all in the book. But eyewitnesses inside Hogwarts Castle saw Potter running away from the scene moments after Dumbledore fell, jumped, or was pushed. Potter later he gave evidence against Severus Snape, a man against whom he was neutral scratch. It's everything as it seems. That is for the wizarding community to decide once they read my book. On that in intriguing note, I take my leave. There can be no doubt that Skeeter was quilled in an instant bestseller. Dumbledore's legion and admirers, meanwhile, may well be trembling at what's the soon to emit about their hero. Harry reached the bottom of the article, but continued to stare blankly at the page. Revulsion and fury rose on him like a vomit. He bought up the newspaper and threw it with all his force at the wall, where it joins the rest of that rubbish heaped around his overfalling bin. He began to stride blindly around the room, opening empty drawers and picking up books, only to replace them on the same piles, barely conscious of what he was 
doing, as random phrases from Rita's article echoed in his head. An entire chapter to the whole Potter Dumbledore relationship. It's been called unhealthy, even sinister. He dabbed in the dark arts himself in his youth. I had access to the source most journalists would swap their wands for. Lies! Harry bellowed, and though through the window he saw the next door neighbor, who had paused to restart his lawn mower, look up nervously. Harry sat down hard in the bed. The broken. Bit of mirror danced away from her. He picked it up and turned it over in his fingers, thinking, thinking of Dumbledore and the lies of which Rita Skeeter was defending him. A flash of brightest blue. Harry flows, his cut finger slipping in his jagged edge of the mirror again. He had imagined it. He must have done. He glanced over his shoulder, but the wall was a sickly peach color of Aunt Petunia's choosing. There was nothing blue. Were there for the mirror to reflect. He peered into the mirror fragment again and saw nothing but his own bright green eyes, seeing, looking back at him. He had imagined it. There was no other explanation. Imagined it, because he had been thinking of his dead headmaster. If anything was certain, it was that the bright blue eyes of Albus Dumbledore would never pierce him again.